Hi everyone. Um, where's Babaram? Is he still outside? Ah, sorry. Um, okay. I'm Kelly Kim from Open Air Korea, and I'm chairing this session. So we'll have a 30 minutes presentation. Um, so uh, approximately seven minutes each for each speakers, and then we'll have like 30 minutes Q and A or discussion session. Um, so I, I hope I, it can, it might, you know, like law regulation, it sounds very boring, but I hope our speakers make it as interesting as possible. So first up will be Ono. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an engineer. So my talk may be. Um, mostly on how to break the law. <laughs> <laughs> this is the story about the uh, Wi-Fi liberation and the fight for internet for all in Indonesia. Okay, uh, this is basically the online in Indonesia before the year 2000 uh, and how we liberate Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, sorry. Why we need to liberate Wi-Fi? Because uh, uh, in the old days, we have to pay 2,000 US dollar per access point, the one uh, on the wall like that. Per year, we have to pay 2,000 US dollars, so we have to fight. Uh, we still have a lot of fight, we have a lot of war right now. Uh, the fight is still, still goes on. So, before 1998, 64K lease line, 400 US dollar per month. Uh, and we have to pay Wi-Fi for 2,000 US dollar per year. So yeah, we are looking at that amount of money. And the uh, internet, we use radio network at the speed about 1.2 kilobit per second. It means one megabyte of file takes about one night to transfer. So we are living in that kind of area. Uh, for if we use a phone, 40.4 and so on. Okay, uh, this is our equipment. Uh, this is our gateway. The left picture is our gateway at the institute. Uh, look at the floppy disk. Very old. And that's actually very our main gateway from Indonesia. Okay. Uh, uh, and then we fight. Uh, we use walk for extending the range of the Wi-Fi. It can go up to like five kilometers. And we publish books educate the people how to build these things. So basically, this is a war between the uh, power, the government, and the money, and people. People, we educate the people, and we can create the mass. Okay. Uh, and then after that, other countries actually uh, learn how to build this thing as well. On the left-hand side, uh, the upper is the uh, article in Bangladesh. The central upper is... Uh, my picture in Bhutan, over there in Vesis, in Geneva. Uh, at the uh, bottom left is, we run a workshop in South Africa. Uh, the other one is in Harvard with Muhammad Yunus. So basically, international acknowledge, adopt, and that's actually creating a huge, huge pressure to Indonesian government. And then they change the law. So that's, that's basically the, uh, the uh, strategy. Uh, finally, in 5 January 2005, the uh, minister sent an act, Wi-Fi is free, but it uh, takes like, it's like eight years to do these things. Okay, So the strategy, they are, we are for strategy, power, fail, we don't have power, money, fail, we don't have money, mass, yes, but we're still not strong enough, international pressure, that's the strongest one. Okay. Uh, we still a lot of homework to do. Neighborhood network, we need, uh, I request for a phone number for the Indonesian. We're still struggling with that. Uh, the Indonesian Ministry of Education, they remove IT from curriculum. We're still fighting with that. And then the uh, picture down there is actually we have built cellular network for Papua and rural Indonesia. It's illegal right now. We're still working with that. Uh, in fact, this morning, I just received email from my friend. They are sending five cellular-based uh, stations 
to Indonesia again and we are still fighting how to struggle the equipment in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Hope all the best. Uh, I'm hoping you can pray for, for us. Thank you. Um, you have like two more minutes. So oh, could, I give could it you, to you guys. No, could you tell us how, why you start the movement or how you begin okay. to know? <laughs> very know, quick. He's a, a big celebrity in Indonesia, but there aren't many Indonesians here. So <laughs> I'm a good guy. <laughs> So basically, I'm an engineer. I know how things work, how build, to, do, uh, to build these things. So I, I know how, how cheap it can be. Uh, I'm, to, be honest, to be honest, I'm a little bit upset how the operator works and set up the price and everything. So that's, that's how I do the rebellion. Yeah, things. but you are an advisor to... Oh, uh, well, okay, okay. <laughs> Kelly? So before 2000, I was the advisor to the, the minister, uh, to the director general for telecommunication, because he consp what what in English consp 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 yeah that's ah, very difficult conspicated our equipment, uh, my friend equipment. So I quit. I quit and I said to them, uh, I will not go to your office until this is finished. So five years, I I never walk into his office and we fight. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing story. So next is getting... Uh, actually, Ono teach me how to break the law. Getting your Aditya. I work in Legal Aid Center for the Press. And my organization has a focus, uh, focus advocacy about the internet freedom, freedom of expression, and freedom of press. And in this year, my organization had to focus internet freedom cases. Uh, before, before I explain about the internet freedom in Indonesia and more about our regulation, I have to explain first about the, our constitution. And this is our constitution. 1945 constitution, article 28, article 20 E, Point three and Article Twenty Eight F. The government and legislative, the government legislative, guarantee and regulate this article to protect our freedom of expression and freedom of press. And this is uh, Article Twenty F, regulate and guarantee about the right to information. And this is uh, our fundamental rights and our human rights, and basic norm in Indonesia. Next. This is law number 39 of 1999 on human rights law, human rights law. And this is the under constitution. And the government and legislative regulate and guarantee more specifically about the freedom of expression and freedom of speech in this article and this law. This is article 14. Every person has the right to communicate and obtain information. They need to develop themselves as individuals and to develop their social environment. In Article 23, every person has the freedom to hold, impair, and widely disseminate his belief orally or in writing through painted or electronic media, taking into consideration religious values, morals, morals law, and order, the public interest, and national unity. In Article 25, every person has, to, has the right to express his opinion in public, and this includes the right to strike according to prevailing laws and regulations. This law is regulated and guaranteed more specifically about the freedom of expression and freedom of, of speech. And this law begins to start to regulate since the authoritarianism regime fall in Indonesia. And this is the limitation on the right to freedom of expression. Uh, the government and legislative regulate in Article 28G.2 of the Constitution in exercising his or her rights and freedom, every person shall have the duty to accept the restriction established below for the sole, sole purpose of guaranteeing the recognition and respect of the rights and freedom of others and satisfying just demand based human consideration of morality, religious value, security, and public order in a democratic society. In this article was adopted from the article from international convenience and civil and political rights.
and we have the limitation, and this is the limitation. Guaranteeing the recognition and respect of the right and freedom of others, and the second, of satisfying just demand based upon consideration of morality, religious value, security, and public order in the democratic society, and this is the limitation. And then we start to, I, I, will, I, will, I will start to explain about the internet freedom and electronic in information and electronic transaction law. The law number is law number 11, 2008, and revised to law number 19, 2060. Uh, I'm not uh, explanation or presentation all about the regulation in this law, but I have, I, I have, I have to focus about the freedom of expression and freedom of speech. That's it only. And this law is regulate all activities internet, such as intellectual property rights, personal data, and blocking website, and all about the uh, all activity internet. And this is our focus advocacy, and especially defamation is related to freedom of expression. Is regulated was regulated in Article 27 about the defamation. Any person who knowingly and without authority distribute and or transmit and or causes to be accessible electronic information and all electronic records with contents of affronts and or defamation. Yes, this regul this reg this article was adopted from our penal code in Indonesia. Okay, this is a uh, regulate about the uh, hoax, blasphemy, and hate speech in Article 28. Point one and two, any person who knowingly and without authority disseminate false and misleading information resulting in consumer loss in electronic transaction, and any person who knowingly and without authority disseminates information aimed at inflicting hatred or dissension on individual and or certain groups or community based on ethnic groups, religion, race, inter and intergroups. This article was adopted from the penal code too. And this is about the personal data, this article. And we still don't have a personal data protection act in Indonesia. The government and legislative not not uh, not regulate it yet. This is the blocking content, Article 40. Yes, and the main issue of internet freedom: it's defamation, blasphemy, lesi majesty, has the article and blocking the website. And this is the main problem of regulation. That's, there's uh, three problems. The first, the article of regulation is very multi-interpretation, especially with defamation. We, we still don't, don't have category what is defamation and what is a critic or opinion. That's the problem. The second, often misuse to criminalization critics and opinion. And the third is unauthorized restriction of freedom of expression. Sorry. And this is possible defense in the prosecution. Yes. And we, we do this defense when we defend our client in the court. And this is case, uh, we handling this case, using your case with defamation, Muatkli Acho, defamation case two, and Ervani case, defamation two, and this is Prita Mulyani case. And Prita Mulyari, Mulyasari case is the first case in Indonesia since the electronic information transaction was regulated. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Gering. And next is Babaram on his own case. He won a huge victory at the Supreme Court, right? Yes. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, rather going through various legislative or constitutional provisions, uh, I am focusing on one single case that we fought in Supreme Court of Nepal, uh, which is related with digital uh, data protection uh, issues. And it's okay. Yeah. This is the case where uh, I myself and my colleague 
Santosh Sikdel is also here. Uh, uh, can you please stand up and uh, uh, receive my acknowledgement? Myself, Santosh Sikdel and Tanka Aryal, we, uh, and, and Tarana Dal, we, three, we four people are uh, petitioner of this public interest litigation, and we've fought this uh, for four years. First, we uh, uh, registered this case uh, in uh, 2012, and final judgment came in 2016. Sorry. Uh, background of case was uh, like this. Uh, one of uh, Supreme Court judge was uh, short dead, uh, and police was doing some investigation on that uh, that case. But uh, it took long period uh, for the investigation. Uh, police uh, didn't get any clue. Then uh, police also. Uh, recorded some, collected some CDR, call details reports, and SMS. Whoever were around Supreme Court, whether it be lawyer or some, any other people who traveled around that uh, area were collected. Four lakhs uh, call details were collected and 60,000 SMS were collected. People uh, didn't know about that collection because, uh, of course, uh, law enforcement agency secretly do all these things. And uh, one day, uh, one of leading newspaper published uh, one news in front page that uh, police collected uh, these informations but didn't get any clue from this investigation. Rather than uh, uh, rather than disposing all those uh, content. Police uh, hold those contents in their office, and uh, police personnel were using those SMS for phone and some other purposes. And that was uh, when that was published in media. Then uh, we decided to uh, file a case. Uh, that incident, particular incident, was a violation of privacy and data protection. Uh, legal issues were that. Uh, we have a uh, very uh, good protection of freedom uh, of expression and privacy in our constitution. Now we have a new constitution uh, passed by a constant assembly, but during that period we had uh, interim constitution. Even in interim constitution, we had uh, good protection of privacy and freedom of expression. And uh, we challenge uh, this uh, case. Uh, uh, was violated, violated to our constitutional protection from both the end, from expression as well as from privacy perspective. Then uh, court uh, upheld our uh, petition, uh, uh, though it took around four years and, and final judgment, even after uh, the judgment, final uh, copy of the uh, judgment came after around one year, almost one year. The uh, major uh, content of judgments were right to privacy is uh, privy of individual and it is related to right to be alone. This was one of fundamental principle or precedents that established our Supreme Court of Nepal that right to privacy is privy of individual and it is related to right to be alone. Another uh, major uh, judgment was that right to privacy denounces any intervention by government or any third party. That means right to privacy is protected. Any intervention by executive or, or any third party is violative to the uh, spirit of uh, or guarantee of the constitution. And uh, another major uh, part of uh, uh, major principle that laid down by the Supreme Court of Nepal in that uh, our case is collection of uh, CDR, call detail reports, uh, uh, and any other uh, digital information is stored in any uh, equipment without uh, due process of law is violative of the constitutional protection. That means uh, in, in next para, uh, as a, uh, another uh, principle, Supreme Court laid down that you have to, uh, to, be, uh, you have to uh, go through the law. If you don't have a law, legislative law, then please follow these directives. And Supreme Court laid down one principle that at least district court approval should be taken for the collection of any uh, CDR, SMS, or any uh, information 
by even by law enforcement um, law enforcement agency uh, for the purpose of investigation of a crime so now uh, after this uh, judgment law enforcement agency started getting approval from district court uh, whatever jurisdiction is uh, they uh, go to the court and then a district court judge will allow within the scope of the investigation and complete the in, uh, uh, when complete the investigation destroy the content this is uh, the case that we fought in supreme court of nepal uh, if you have any queries i'm ready to respond thank you Very glad that everybody is like keeping their time exactly. Um, I'm Kelly, um, and I'm a I'm a lawyer as well, um, and I'm working for OpenNet Korea, which is um, organization NGO in South Korea, not in North Korea. Um, and um, I, I I don't know how many of you know that uh, South Korea is the first country which um, adopted internet real name law system like 10 years ago uh, ahead of China or now even Russia. You know, China now has um, real name policy for Baidu or, uh, or, 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 the, or their like uh, online website, internet, internet websites. Anyways, um, so uh, let me give you some background. So Korea you know, South Korea has a very fast internet connection and all, and we had really vibrant online social communities before Facebook or be even before Google. So many people like to, you know, comment online, you know, post, you know, blogs and, um, yeah, all those comments online. And, you know, also, there were many criticisms against the government, politicians, and also um, the companies or the rich people or uh, even celebrities. And the government, uh, the Minister of ICT, <clears throat> as a solution to this defamation or instant online, <coughs> sorry, proposed a plan to introduce a the internet real name system. So if people have to comment under their real name, um, you know, the government thought that people wouldn't, you know, post like bad malicious comments or bad comments online. Um, so in 2004, of course, politicians are the, you know, they are um, the most, um, how to say, uh, vulnerable or most sensitive to this criticisms or attacks against against them so so internet real name system for online news media during the election period was in, introduced in 2004 so if you wanted to comment on on those news media uh, on those news articles you had to you know post under your real name um, and then the re internet real name system for all internet or the internet, whole internet, like all internet website was finally adopted in July 2007, so it's like 11 years ago. Um, so as a form of newly amended Information and Communications Network Act. And the, later the law was named after this um, famous Korean actress, oopsie, uh, Choi jin Shil. So he, she committed suicide in 2008, and it was said that he committed, she committed a suicide because of those malicious comments on, on all those internet porters and yeah, people thought that this law was really re needed, you know, to uh, root out those defamatory comments. So, so we, ha we introduced this law, oopsie, okay, hmm, okay, it's, sorry. Um, so, or, hmm, okay, there's no red or uh, light. Ah, okay. So, identity verification. So, like, state organ or government websites or, like, 
public enterprise website or or like internet uh, website or internet service providers who has a visitors of like 100,000 person per day had to adopt like identity verification system and you know we Korea have a national ID system called registration resident registration number so Koreans or every South Korean is given with a unique identifier uh, which consists of um, six digits of your birth date and um, your gender, one or two, like female or male, there's no like three or four, and also where you were born and other like identifiers. So we were born with, like we we're given, assigned this unique identifier, this number called RRN, uh, when we were born. And so this identity verification system utilized this RRN. So all these like websites, all these internet companies, all, all these um, telecommunication companies had to collect our RRN, which is very, very important um, um, intimate um, personal information identifier because of this law. Um, you know, and you know, of course there are, there are so many data breaches after that and uh, data leakage and breaches. So like as of like 2000, 2007, April, all like major website, like internet portals, like Naver is the largest portal. It's larger than Google in Korea. They all had to adopt this uh, real name, this internet real name system. So there was a um, fight against um, the system, of course, and there, uh, we formed a coalition of public interest lawyers and digital rights activists and also internet companies and we filed a constitutional complaint in 2010 and that's KS Park um, and in two years two years later the constitutional court struck the law down so the constitution Tushana Court basically said that the internet real name system is unconstitutional because it violates people's right to, I mean, people's freedom to um, anonymous, anonymous speech. Uh, but yeah, however, so it was a huge victory and the coalition, the coalition uh, became um, the basis of openness. So the people who were, who were like the members of the coalition became the founders of OpenNet because they uh, realized that we need a like public interest lawyers group who can fight against this, you know, bad laws. So, you know, there are lawyers who comply, who, who are there to comply with the law and there are lawyers who are there to break the law or change the law. And so OpenNet was founded to the one who which would change the law and break the laws. So, but however, we still have um, internet real name system for government agencies and public institutions, and also for election, during election, you have to post comments online under your real name. And also there are so many age verification requirements where you have to uh, put in your like RRN and verify your, to verify your age. And also um, in, Three years ago, mandatory SIM card registration law was passed. Although we had like telecoms just voluntarily did um, SIM card reg registration, but now we have like mandatory SIM card registration law. Um, so everybody in Korea has to use the mobile phone under their real name. And so we are like challenging this against the constitutional court now. Um, yeah, I filed a, a complaint about a year ago. And now, this era of fake news and disinformation, now all those lawmakers, politicians are now bring this internet real name law again as a solution to the fake news or disinformation. Okay. So that's it, thank you. So, any questions, comments? Many thanks for the presentations. We have a mixed lawyers and engineer. 
Uh, my questions will be both to lawyers and engineers. Uh, an important uh, research report from UNESCO that uh, shows that the internet governance bodies give a little consideration to the children's rights. If there is any way by law and regulations to protect the children from getting abuse while they are using the internet? This is the first question. Second, Get my second question. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you think one day we reach the point that the human values and rights in virtual world will be the same as in real world? Thank you. This is for engineer and for the lawyers. <laughs> no, lawyer first. Welcome. <laughs> uh, one first question. A uh, little consideration uh, on child protection. Actually, uh, in USA, CDA uh, uh, sparked with uh, discussion uh, basically on decency and uh, protection of child. Then uh, ACLU, American uh, organization fight, uh, fought for uh, freedom of expression and then there were a series of uh, judgments. And in uh, that series of judgments, one uh, final uh, resolution was uh, that protection of children is important and uh, decency pornography is different thing that uh, basically pornography adult content is uh, it should be allowed uh, after the certain uh, classification but uh, that judgment clearly said uh, children will be protected and whatever measures to be implemented to protect uh, children shall be followed for example in that judgment uh, it is said that in public schools or public library, in particular that case, uh, wherever uh, government funded for those institutions, they should install certain technology uh, to avoid uh, access to children. One is access to children, another is using children for those contents. So, uh, uh, law uh, around the world now, uh, trying to develop these kind of principles. For example, uh, even in my country, in, in Nepal, we are now having a new uh, legislation on ICD. And uh, fortunately, I am also one of person who contributed uh, uh, in that process. And my colleagues Santos and Romkant are also uh, part of this process. Then in this legislation, that what we have proposed that uh, misuse of children in any that, that kind of uh, uh, purpose is prohibited. So sometimes law also can make certain provisions, maybe a, a technologically, sometimes it's uh, economically it's difficult, but uh, service providers, they should maintain this kind of uh, protections, especially uh, to protect children. Uh, that th this is one of major issue that around the world, all the jurisdictions, all the countries, they accept that uh, misuse of children, and uh, this is uh, whatever format or offline or online is uh, bad, and uh, this is uh, uh, struck down by legislative process. In, in some countries, they have uh, a software called uh, I think uh, Child Protection System. Mm -hmm is pre-installed by uh, internet service provider and uh, monitored by the government. In, in Jordan, we have uh, such thing like that. Uh, this is, we can mitigate, yeah, yeah we can, uh, in a way or another, we can uh, protect uh, children. If we have, we have to convince 
the service providers first. Thank you. Um, um, on that note, um, like, but we are all adults here, right? And we should um, remind ourselves that children have their own rights too. But the thing is their voice on heard because you know, they are still young and they cannot form a group or you know, it's hard for them to make their voices heard. Um, and normally, especially in Asian countries, we focus more on child protection than promoting you know, their rights, okay? They have a right to freedom of expression, they have a right to access information, you know, they have the right to know like, about, you know, like condoms, you know, or, you know, those, those information. And also they have right to privacy as well, but, you know, those parents always post, you know, their children's like naked photos on Facebook and, but they never ask for consent from their children, right? So when we talk about like child protection, we also need to talk about um, promoting their own rights as well. So, um, but so far the discussion, the narrative has been too much focused on um, protecting them, but we should um, consider them as uh, independent human being and we should, uh, I think it's time to focus more on like promoting their their own rights and um, let them have like voices, make their voices heard, especially in, in, in like IGF, like so use IGF like that um, in this like international fora. And also, and you, you are, uh, uh, an answer to my answer to your second question is like, of course, that's what we are doing. Human values and human rights offline should be also equally protected and promoted online. That's what we are doing, and that's what um, the UN Human Rights Council or like UN Special Rapporteur on all those human rights are keep saying. So, in that in that note, yeah, I, yeah, I totally think so. Oh, okay, okay, I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Shah Jahidur Rahman from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm Question to Babura Mainal, I just want to know uh, for uh, Debbie from country perspective. So how do you re uh, regulate uh, our, um, your government monitoring uh, the network traffic? Like in Bangladesh, uh, we are some of the, uh, mostly the big operators uh, like telecommunication operator uh, and uh, other ISP, those are a big setup. They are bound to pass their traffic through other devices like the government have given the uh, regulations. We cannot pass our traffic directly we have to go through via their devices. So in this scenario, uh, how your country handle uh, the regulation? Because you said that CDR and other data, uh, you request the government, you are bound to give them, right? So if uh, the operators have uh, this source of access, then it might be more regulatory confirmations, right? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in Nepal, uh, as I said, uh, we don't have uh, a separate uh, data protection act, uh, separate privacy laws. Uh, what uh, our case was about the privacy uh, and data protection, and about the uh, uh, operators' network uh, exchange and all these uh, communications, uh, um, regulator has uh, their. Uh, uh, one uh, license agreement and, and based on that license agreement, regulators have, they have um, uh, certain authority on that regulation. And uh, even for that purpose, uh, regulator uh, will not collect those uh, content that w which uh, reveals uh, personal identity. Uh, like uh, uh, traffic of uh, bandwidth, ups and downs, uh, uh, like uh, MRTG graph, these are the, uh, collected uh, by the op, uh, by the regulator, but not personally identifying information exchanged by ISPs or operators. In the case of any fraud, like uh, anyone is doing uh, some sorts of uh, unauthorized access to the page, how they could identify the specific IP address and how they could find out the uh, uh, for, for the identification of this uh, IP address and all these things, you have to go through the court now. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, thank you to, for the, to the panel for such enlightening mm -hmm. uh, case studies. Um, so the real aim system that you talked about in Korea, 
um, Pakistan has kind of a variation of that because um, our mobile cellular subscribers, all of them are biometrically verified. Around 140 million SIMs we have in the market right now and all of them are biometrically verified. I think it was kind of the first, pro first project of its kind in the world. Uh, because we had other challenges to look after too. You know, we had you know, the security situations and terrorism and all that. Now, when we talk about real name system for internet, because you know things are getting very murky in the internet world as well now, since mobiles are not that being are not available to you to be used by such channels and such elements. There is a, a certain cost associated with it as well. Uh, if you want to implement a real name system like this, and I believe this was the case in Korea as well. Um, but to the best of my, of my knowledge, I think in 2012, Supreme Court of Korea also ruled against the real name system. Is it true? I read it somewhere. Constitution. Oh, it was the constitution. Okay. So if we have to implement the same thing on the internet, where the number of users is a multiplier of the mobile subscribers or whatever, how would the operators would be able to cope with the costs? Number one. Number two, um, our data, um, like for you, as you have ex you have referred that you know uh, you have to go through the court or uh, to to get CDRs of anybody. Uh, we have a cyber crime law as well, a cyber crime act. In fact, we have, uh, and it is pretty much the same as you guys have. But um, the thing is, when um, when you give your identity to somebody, um, it's not it's not 100% guaranteed that they will keep it that way, right? It could be leaked, um, even if even through the court, I, I believe. I mean, it's not it's not their human say. So how do we first make sure that the data or the system that we're going to develop is secure enough and centralized enough to handle such kind of data? Uh, are there any examples from the countries that we are here in the panel right now where they made sure that the data would be handled? appropriately by the by the agency that is handling it um, so these are kind of two questions now sorry yeah so um first question costs we don't know it's it's up to the companies right because it's uh, um it's mandated by the law so the government are telling the companies just to follow the law comply with the law so um, they don't really complain or they didn't really um have a choice yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm not sure about the cost. We need a pr uh, person from the company or something. <laughs> but second one, yes, so data. I, I don't think there's any way to um, safely, like perfectly safely store those, you know, those very intimate personal information. So the best way is not to collect them, right? So that's why uh, we fought against the, those internet real name laws because they just uh, make those companies to necessarily collect all those personal information. And the government are saying, so we have to protect our people from defamatory contents or bad contents online. At the same time, they are allowing you know, those data processors to collect our personal information and there are so many data breaches um, and also it also allows um, surveillance easy mass surveillance very easy so like in 2014 um, so about like uh, 14 million people's uh, personal information were given to given to the investigatory agencies like police and all uh, and we have like 50 million people. So at least like 25, 30% of like all Korean uh, personal information were given to um, those uh, investigatory authorities without warrant. And most of them were given by the telecom companies, telecommunication companies. So the best solution is not to have such system. But if once you have a system, I don't think there's any you know perfect way or like the safest way to um, to protect those information. So I mean, I mean I'm not a techie, so maybe um, maybe Ono knows us have an idea. <laughs> the Indonesian, I think, like three months ago, we start collecting. The government asked the operator to uh, to uh, to all the uh, SIM card 
owner to register their identity. And to be honest, the data is leaked and we have a lot of breaches. So uh, it can be done if the government uh, seriously invests on the system. But the minister only asked to, for registration without, uh, was it, uh, checking the system first. So that's what happened. We, uh, I work in the company that provide like security services. Uh, we actually providing services to the army and everything. So actually, we capable to do that. But this is like like two three days process. So we give up. <laughs> uh, in in this uh, uh, cost of uh, new uh, regulation or new requirement for any uh, operators is always divided. Uh, as uh, a legal advisor of ISP Association of Nepal, I had certain experience in Nepal. Uh, whenever uh, Nepal Telecom Authority uh, asked to service providers to implement certain uh, policies, uh, there were some costs. For example, uh, they uh, regulator required uh, filtering certain content, and then uh, who will uh, install these uh, softwares and who will pay for these softwares. If operators, uh, they require to install, consumer will be paying. Because uh, obviously, the, so uh, in this kind of issues, then uh, this kind of uh, condition, regulators should be very wise uh, to minimize the cost of consumer from, from one, uh, one that and another thing is, uh, uh, for the protection of data collected uh, from where, uh, whatever mode, accountability of data collector, whoever collects, like uh, uh, if it's law enforcement agency or police or it's regulator, if there are certain uh, laws uh, that makes uh, those collectors or uh, who storage the data is accountable, then in that case, it will be good. Uh, good. If there is no such kind of accountability, uh, legislative or uh, rules, then in that case, those agencies will collect uh, information and misuse of those information will be okay. Thank you. Finally. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm Sridip and I'm from Asia. Nepal. <laughs> Just joking. Yeah, so, you know, Asia has been hugely criticized for FOE and censorship, all these issues. Though uh, there are, there seems to be appropriate rights and laws accordingly. How do you uh, see uh, public policy and governance working in this region? Because I see a lot of gap. And because of this gap, there is an issue. Because the voices from the people is not going, the public policy process is weak. And the governance is not happening, right? From the government side, if you look at it, it's right. They are doing everything right. From the civil society side, you know, whatever they are doing right. So where are we lacking? OK. Uh, in Indonesia, and that's a problem. Because in one regulation, it's not consistent with the other regulation. That's the problem. The implementation is a problem. Uh, I have to explain the one case. For, for example, defamation case. The case is about the defamation, but the police station often they using the head speech article. That's the problem. And the process to build and regulate the electronic and information trans trans transaction law, the government and legislative not transparent to the, the public. And that's the problem too. And the electronic and information tra transaction law is, is uh, not uh, not accommodate all the problem in the reality. So we 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 have the homework. We have problem in culture, in the system, and the substance that's in Indonesia. Maybe or no? Can uh, I, I I look at from different angle from engineering point of view. To be honest, we Indonesian the government actually not me. The government, they censoring the internet, and that's creating creating a lot of problem because they actually sniffing 
what is sniffing in normal world uh, surveillance. surveillance the uh, our traffic the uh, uh, private traffic through the internet uh, so I against that actually personally against that my opinion personally I like I don't really like uh, censorship if they are looking for pornographic or terrorist just grab the person put it in jail that's it and we can do international collaboration grab the person put it in jail uh, but this doesn't happen because like censorship doesn't solve the problem, problem. That's, that's the problem. yeah that's my opinion though but i'm engineer i'm i'm not <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 if you go through uh, my article uh, published in the site there are around 20 case laws that i mentioned and what i found that uh, courts are progressive Courts are protecting uh, citizens' rights for expressions, and executives are trying to control. So uh, this kind of two approaches you can find in this region if you uh, uh, try to look into uh, these activities. Yeah. Uh, maybe the public process, the public uh, policy process is not strong enough. That's where we have to drive. Um, yes, that's what we are doing here right now. Right. And we don't have much time, but what I want to say is that I don't think the government is evil. They are, I mean, I believe in their goodwill. Right, right. They want their protection. Yeah, they just want to do things right. <laughs> but because we are like civil society is small and our voice is not really heard. So that, that's why we are, all, everyone here is important, you know? And, you know, we fight back and we get good results. So we should continue to fight back against bad laws and, one day it will change, and we are. Go I think we are heading to the right direction. direction so so maybe one last quick uh, question. Just make it very brief. Okay. Hi, I am Surinder from Nepal. So my question to Kelly. So there is a long system of national ID system in Korea. So uh, government of Nepal is also introducing such system in Nepal. But there is a threat or query in Nepal that how this data are used, whether it is misused or not. So what is the practice or what is the experience of Korea on that matter? I mean, it is, it is so wrong to have such a national ID system. Uh, we adopted, in, adopted a system in 1960s um, and the dictator Park, you know, whose daughter was impeached like last year. <laughs> Um, so he introduced uh, the national ID system to, you know, um, to find North, North Korean, to detect North Korean spies. So he thought that if every Korean has a unique number, then if someone ha doesn't have a number, then he's like North Korean spy. That's, that was just his idea. But once the ID system was implemented, you know, it's been used in so many ways and the personal information has been collected to so many uh, agencies and now there are so many data breaches and it's just so bad. Uh, so it's better to fight back when the system, when the government is trying to introduce the system, but once it's implemented, then I think it's, it, I think um, we like the civil society and the technical community as watchdog, we have to um, make uh, make sure that the law or the system has safeguards, okay? Like in um, whether in the way they protect um, personal, how they protect the personal information or all those, you know, safety measures. Okay, <laughs> sorry, we don't have much time, so. Okay, um, <laughs> um, does anyone have, I want to have, okay. Thank you everyone.